Welcome to the Glade Studio. This is Gomati Sivasankaran, founder CEO of the Guiding Light Art Company, building bright futures through art. Today, the 10th and the last episode of season 1 of the Glaze What Next series change management and practice we are meeting an innovation evangelist somebody who has had immense amount of exposure experience into private sector uh, government companies and also heading government organizations before he retired only to start again with startups we are meeting somnath kosh After retiring from the position of Chairman and Managing Director, the National Research Development Corporation, India, Somnath Ghosh started out with Mojo Panda. Mojo Panda works with sheep herders in the upper reaches of the Himalayas in Himachal and Uttarakhand in helping to improve the economic livelihood of the herdsmen and their flock of sheep. The objective of the program is to get a better remuneration for the herdsmen by improving the health of their sheep and getting a higher price for their wool. The wool obtained is certified organic and so is the subsequent processing of the wool by using non-chemical technology, solar dryers and other environment friendly technology interventions. The cleaned, processed, got certified wool is either directly exported to the markets in Europe or converted into products as per the requirement of the clients. Without much ado, let's meet Somnath. Somnath sir, welcome to the Glaze What Next series, uh, Change Management in Practice. This is an utmost pleasure to be having you in this 10th um, episode. Uh, of Glaze What Next series, Change Management in Practice. We have been talking for a while, trying to find some time, and it's been an ordeal. You have gone through a lot, and I'm super happy now that we are able to talk. Um, welcome, sir, again. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's great. Uh, I'm very happy to connect finally. Of course, we've been talking for quite a while. But yeah. for some reason or the other, we've been not been able to take this forward. And one of the reasons has been COVID. You know? oh, yes. So that's what it is. It's been affecting all of us. And the situation uh, was pretty bad here in India, especially in this part uh, where I come from, which is around Delhi, Delhi NCR. Yes. And, but now things are looking a lot better. So, uh, of course, the lockdown is still not being lifted. Mm -hmm. But we do see traffic on the road because the hours have been uh, relaxed and there is, uh, you know, and okay. uh, hopefully by next week the lockdown should be lifted as well. Mm -hmm. We expect is it that. subsiding in this part of uh, um, the city or the country? Oh, yes, it is subsiding. It, the numbers are dropping very rapidly. As yes. rapidly it has risen, it's dropping, uh, you know, at the same pace, coming down very rapidly. Yeah, I think it was just a spike and now it's coming down yes. the curve. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, but I, I hear fortunate. also yeah, I hear also from the southern part of India that it's hitting a spike, so it's like a wave, eh? Yeah, the problem is the country is so large that different regions go through different phases. So each of the uh, each of the cities, the major hubs, has its own cycle. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is, is better, but some of the other regions which were far less affected in the past are, you know, getting more affected now. Mm. can see that. But uh, thank you again, sir, for uh, having made it through this. And uh, I really wish that, you know, everything goes on well for all of us uh, through this yeah. uh, pandemic. Yeah. Yes. Right, right. Yeah. 
before we kick start the show, I would like you to just open the floor and give a brief introduction to the audience about yourself. Well, um, I consider myself to be an innovation evangelist. I saw uh, that comment. Use, use, use technology for improving our lifestyle, for getting a better lifestyle mm. for all of us. And that has been our endeavor lately. By better, I mean being a lifestyle that is more sustainable, natural, green, based on organic inputs. That means, uh, you know, uh, what products that we make should be biodegradable and recyclable. Mm -hmm. And the company that we founded uh, is basically, that's Mojo Panda, basically aims to work in this direction. Yeah. Being a chemical engineer by profession, I'm aware of the huge uh, overload the, uh, my industry, the chemical, the petrochemical industry has had in the entire yes. global economy. And uh, in the last 50 years, uh, there's been a drastic uh, deterioration of the quality of, uh, you know, everything, the quality of the soil, uh, water, air, and which is impacting in terms of climate change and a uh, whole lot of things which are interrelated. Mm -hmm. So we need to take a conscious effort. We mean all of us across the globe need to take on a conscious effort to reverse this process. Yeah. And it's not going to be easy. Oh. Of course, there are some targets. There are some global targets. There are some UN targets of oh. uh, net zero, achieving net zero. Some targets by 2030 and other target by 2050. Mm -hmm. uh, at the government level, the top level, there is endeavor to work in those directions. Uh, of course, uh, developing economies like uh, India uh, are trying to negotiate uh, a, a timeline which may be going beyond 2050, mm -hmm. but all that is still under negotiation. But as citizens, as responsible citizens, yes. we need to do our bit. Yeah. And our journey in uh, Mojo Panda addresses these issues in a small way. Uh, we believe in the merit of using natural fibers for our clothing and for a whole lot of, uh, in fact, the clothing industry, the fashion industry, yeah. is one of the largest polluters because of uh, synthetics being used extensively. Yes. And Single use. People wear a garment, buy a garment, wear it a few times, and they throw it away. So it just, you know, uh, it, when you throw away a garment by using after using a few times, you may think it's a small uh, uh, action by you, but cumulatively across the world, it's creating a major overload in terms of garbage dumps, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, because the, this decay, the, it doesn't decay. Synthetic garments don't decay fast. They take no. thousands of years. And in that period, they spread across the soil. They run into river bodies. Uh, our fishes ingest that plastic, in, uh, you know, when it degrades. And that's affecting the quality of uh, fisheries. And when we eat that, it's in, uh, affecting the quality of lives of human beings. So it's a process, interrelated process. Yeah. And uh, we started with wool uh, in Mojo Panda. Then we extended that to silk. And now we uh, also had added cotton in our portfolio. Okay. So all of these are certified organic. Uh, we are in the business of supplying fibers to those who need in bulk, mm -hmm. as well as converting into products. In fact, uh, the uh, uh, name of the company Mojo Panda comes uh, from uh, conjugating two words, Mojo and Panda. Mojo means fun. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, uh, full of energy. And uh, Panda in Sanskrit uh, uh, relates to men of knowledge. If you go yes. to any, 
it, it, it relates to men of knowledge. Men of knowledge. Okay. If you go to any temple town in northern India, you have these pandas who surround you and they uh, do all the mantras on your behalf. Yeah. And they keep your family genealogy for for ages, for millennium. They can go back 10, 15 generations. Okay. okay. So I come from a temple town, which is uh, Allahabad. Okay, it's not too much of a temple there, but it's supposed to be very religious. Yes. But if you go to any place, Allahabad, Varanasi, or uh, or uh, uh, you know Puri, or mm-hmm. up in the hills, you have these pandas who manage that knowledge. Okay. So what we say is the work we are doing is fun with knowledge. Fun with knowledge. Yeah. That's nice fun to with know. Knowledge. That's what we, we uh, what we mean to do, and that's our endeavor. It's not a the uh, knowledge is not a burden it is fun to play around with mm. and in the process improve our lifestyle it does it does i honestly thought you know, you're referring to the animal panda <laughs> well uh, the panda is an animal has become a very popular term yes okay uh, i think uh, relate to uh, immediately uh, yeah uh, i think they have been uh, who, uh, you know been uh, more successful in popularizing that term mm. but panda relating to the uh, priests of okay. hindu religion who manage hindu religion mm. they back you know few thousand years 2000 years or more wow okay okay so uh, uh, so it's a, but of course perhaps that element has not been brought out in popular public uh, no. in yeah we we often times hear the word pandit or yes uh, referring so pandit to the... and panda these are all related terms ah okay okay Because these are related i have a connection to the uh, the hindu religion as well um but this term is quite new for me and uh, so it's a learning sir thanks for explaining okay. it that in very brief of uh, you know uh, what we are doing yeah currently and uh, of course uh, the, the business that we are in uh, we basically work with herders and tribesmen who mm. herd the sheep in the upper regions of the himalayas where we source the wool from mm-hmm. my partner shushantu and i have been doing this for the last 5 years now yeah and we developed this whole program uh, we developed our own processes to ensure that the entire process is got compliant mm mm-hmm. uh, global got the global uh, organization for the technical uh, te- uh, you know textile standards and they basically uh, approve of the organic requirements okay used in textiles so we comply with that so it's called gots compliance yeah it got g o t s is the word okay i'm just noting it down as well that's a, it's a european body mm mm-hmm. that we comply with yeah Okay before we go more into what Mojo Boranda is doing I want to just go back into your career lane and um you did your uh, mtech from IIT and after that I have seen in your profile that you've been working with institutions mm-hmm. like uh, Larsen and Tugro and also uh, other organizations uh, before you started this i just wanted to understand where did this idea come from that you have to move into this sustainability factor of chemical you say okay. you could do something with so, the the wool and you know cotton and so on where did the idea come from well uh, it's a long story i did my <laughs> undergraduate from iit kanpur Mm-hmm. and did from and post graduation from iit delhi yeah so and both in chemical engineering 
that used to be a five year program at that time now it's a four year program okay. and followed by that a uh, masters again uh, in chemical engineering from iit delhi mm. and uh, typically in iit you have campus interviews so i joined the uh, uh, lassen and tubro that come for campus recruitment and that's how i picked up in fact uh, the reason is i shortlisted a few companies to join and this was on the top of my list because the few months earlier before our graduation in summer uh, the previous december we had a annual session of iicht indian zero chemical engineers where the chief guest was hot last who was heading last in tubro and i was very impressed by the talk that he gave so that was the main reason of my selecting uh, lnp to join and fortunately uh, got in and uh, we joined the uh, r&d of lnp at that time okay the industrial r&d was something very very new uh, in india those days those days yeah and the lnp was one of the early uh, companies who had got into this space and it was a very exciting time to be there and uh, occasionally uh hawk lassen himself who was at that time the chairman emeritus who would come to our department and give a talk and really motivate us so mm. he had time or i mean to say he had time mm. for a uh, department uh, like us which was really insignificant in the operations of lnt at that time yeah because it had just been formed, it was just be the department had just been formed Two years before I joined. Okay. It's a new entity, but work was good. Work was exciting. I was there for about uh, seven years. Yeah. And did some good work. Uh, grew with the organization, but after a while, one becomes complacent. Yes, it does. Because in a very large organization, you are put in a groove. When you just do that, you may excel in it. okay but you just keep doing that you just keep polishing the same things so i was looking for uh, uh, more challenges mm mm-hmm. and uh, typically uh, that's when i uh, you know uh, when perhaps i was getting a little restless mm-hmm. and uh, for whatever may be the reason I decided to join a company which was uh, uh, at that time the I Okay okay so it was in computer business hardware and software solutions business so I okay. joined the solutions I joined the software solutions business which was a consultancy uh, related work mm-hmm. building solutions for corporates okay. mm. and there were some large corporates at that time Uh, mm. the automotive sector in mm. uh, in uh, de- in uh, identifying the hardware and the software that needs to be done to set up their uh, path in uh, the uh, or building their road map of getting into the business of so that they do they develop their uh, 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 automobiles and the new products on their own using those mm. tools mm. okay that's how it is and anyway at that time uh, had a lot of time at hand so you do a lot of reading and um, i was influenced by uh, the, uh, the writings of futurists like alvin toffler okay who uh, had talked about he had written about uh, future is approaching us at an accelerated pace mm. this was sometime in the 80s early 80s i'm talking about yeah that means uh, our uh, things are going to change rapidly and the pace of change is going to increase mm. okay that was a thought that we was he had put across and yeah. uh, uh, year 1984 was also the year of the animal farm mm. okay so it's coming out of that generation and uh, i joined this it company and uh, worked there for about 2 years uh, and the people who were heading that company 
later on went on to start or drive the IT revolution in India. They were the people who started the trade bodies like NASCOM. There was another trade body for hardware, mm. a trade body for training. Yeah. These were all started by the directors of that company, which is called Hindutron, Hindutron Computers. Yeah. Okay. So we worked very close with them. They were real good leaders, real good managers real good motivators, but uh, I suppose uh, at that time you're young, you're full of passion, you want to do things, and I uh, thought exposure that I've had in these two companies fired me to strike on my own. Yeah. So I set up my own consulting firm, a technical consulting firm, and uh, building and design solutions for the process engineering sector, the sector okay. that I understood. Okay. Uh, that I ran for about 14 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were doing very well, but we needed to grow much faster. We need to grow the whole thing. And for that, we needed investments. Mm -hmm. And early stage investments were not, uh, you know, uh, not that free, available, that not readily available in India at that point of time. Okay. And most of the investments in companies were in service organizations which were providing software development services rather than software product uh, development. Develop. What we developed the software products, mm. which was at that time not known. No. Yeah. I'm, I'm really about, surprised because the years that you're talking about, a lot of people were not so much into technology the way we are now, you know, at least for the generation that is now, they will be curious what exactly was that period all about. And I think people were more skeptical, isn't it? If I may say. Uh, well, uh, well uh, uh, generally, I would say yes. But if you look at the way we came from, mm -hmm. say IIT Kanpur, IIT Kanpur was at the cutting edge of technology education at that point of time. Yeah. Okay. We had, uh, 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 they had already set up a, uh, a holograph lab. That means mm -hmm. holograms were being created. Yeah. 3D images being created. I'm talking about 70s, mid 70s. Yeah. Okay. And there was a lot of freedom given to students uh, at IIT Kanpur. Uh, uh, IIT Kanpur was a U.S. Uh, funded uh, institute. At that time, the, each of the IITs were funded by different countries, uh, aid coming from different countries, and this was okay. U.S. funded. So yeah. we had, uh, first of all, we had a lot of faculty from the U.S., plus the uh, style, the, the freedom that was given mm. to the normal students. You could just go across to any lab, work there, the mm. computer center was open 24 by 7. Library was open till midnight. And you can work in any lab. You can walk into any lab and do your work. There was a very good interaction between the faculty and students. We were very close. Okay, and that continued even after we graduated out of uh, college. So, so it was a different world. Yeah. And that continued in our work uh, environment as well. When you started out with the idea of uh, Mojo Panda, um, how was it for you? It was it easy, difficult with the idea because there's a fair share of involvement from tribal community as well. Yes, yes. Uh, actually, uh, in uh, uh, one of the companies I was involved in prior to my retirement, Bojo Panda started post retirement. Mm. I retired, uh, typically here we retire when you turn 60 and uh, I retired from a formal job in 2013. And my last assignment uh, was the chairman and managing director of a body called NRDC, National Research Development Corporation. Yeah. Which is basically into building businesses or assisting uh, new businesses based on technologies sourced from a research network and universities. So okay. we had a large connect with universities, research organizations, and corporates 
both large corporates as well as startups, new ones, and where we would uh, the the uh, the uh, standard process was licensing the technology that we sourced from a lab, we license it to the corporate sector, but also there were support mechanisms available through our ministry, Ministry mm. of Science and Technology. Uh, one of the departments that I reported to was DSIR, the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research, under the Ministry of Science and Technology. And they have a lot of support mechanisms. Mm. And uh, many of these companies that were supported at that time are doing extremely well. Mm. Okay. So that was a good, uh, uh, a good initiative. And since these are government-funded initiatives, a lot of focus was in the uh, in the social sector, mm. working in remote locations, yeah, and doing something for them. So we did a lot of work in the northeast, in Mizoram, in Nagaland. Uh, the very interesting stories uh, there: how we transformed the tribal communities out there. We did a lot. Uh, on behalf of uh, uh, government-funded projects through the Ministry of External Affairs, we did a lot of work in Africa. So that took me to many countries in Africa. We, we put up projects. Okay. And we shared our knowledge and experience and trained them to be uh, independent, self-sufficient, using their own local resources. Awesome. Okay. So that was a training that was already built in yeah. for, for quite some time mm. in the last uh, period of my job. Okay. It was very exciting. So we understood the process. We understood the pains. Mm. So it was that learning that I brought to Mojo Panda. Both me and my partner, Shushanto, we worked on this. Okay. Shushanto had been working in uh, with uh, handic in the handicrafts area and working with craftsmen all his life. He had okay. been working with wood wood craftsmen and he had a base in Saranpur, which is a wood manufacturing hub. And uh, but wood is non renewable resource. Mm. So in this phase, we want to focus on renewable resource. Which is natural. Yeah. And uh, while I worked with NRDC, we worked on one project which was very interesting, which we did for uh, uh, Mizoram, was to work with bamboo. Mm. And we uh, got people to make engineered products from bamboo. Wow. Okay, like the flooring that I have in my house is made of bamboo that we created, <laughs> the, you know, created using those the programs that we had, support programs that we had. Okay. Amazing. So like this, uh, we had, we used to create natural products and we used them. Mm. Of course, some of those uh, were uh, successful commercially. But not all get successful commercially. No. There are various other reasons for that. But the conversion does take place. Mm. So that's how it is. Okay. And right now, Mojo Panda, um, you are producing garments using this sustainable or natural wool and cotton and silk yes uh, we do produce typically the products that we make mm. is uh, user driven when we have a client if we have a client he asks for something mm -hmm. then when we sit down I start working on that and develop a product for them okay okay and once we develop the product uh, we, uh, of course, when you develop product, you uh, do, you train a lot of people. Mm. Again, these are people in remote locations. We mostly work with women on these projects. In the conversion projects, people who work with us are largely women. Mm -hmm. And we train them. And once that is there, we can't abandon them. No. So we have to give them 
a continuous source of income. Yes. Whether that product is picked up by a buyer or not. So therefore, we sell it through our e-commerce channels. Okay. Okay. Like, for instance, we say set up a training facility in uh, in uh, Badoi, mm -hmm. which is a carpet hub, where we train women to weave carpets. Mm. Okay. Okay. So, and uh, these women can you give them a design. You give them an abstract drawing, uh, painting that you have behind you. Okay. And you will reproduce that painting on the carpet. Wow. Okay. That's the kind of skill set that they have. And this is all natural, organic wool. Mm -hmm. And the colors that we use are also non-toxic colors, goth compliant, which we import from Germany. Okay. So it's a whole new market for a different segment. Amazing. Do you have clients from across the globe um, or based in India? How is the client? Well, uh, if you look at organic products, uh, primary clients have to be overseas. Mm. Most of them are from Europe. Okay. Because in India, the appreciation of something organic, non-toxic, biodegradable is a new concept. Mm. And uh, not very many people are willing to pay the premium mm. to get this. However, in the last year or two, especially in this COVID period, we do see a change in perception. Okay. From the larger buyers, because in India, the major procurers of wool, for instance, they mm -hmm. never use wool from the Indian uh, sheep grazing mm -hmm. on our hills. They used to import the wool and convert it into whatever product they want, cardigans mm -hmm. and, and sell, whether the Indian market or export. They never used Indian uh, wool. Mm -hmm. Okay. What we are assessment was when we started working in terms of quality our wool is equally good the reason being about 40 years back or more uh, the government had imported high quality rams rambule rams from uh, uh, europe russia and europe from that part okay. and they had let these lambs uh, you know uh, mix with the local breeds mm -hmm. and to improve the quality of wool. And this initiative is still going on by our government incrementally. So the quality of wool is being improved. Okay. But the manage, management practices mm. were not good. They would mix up different kinds of wool, colors, uh, microns, yeah. and mix it up. You get the price for the lowest quality. Okay. Okay, so we started a process by implementing management practices mm. right from the time of shearing. Yeah. First, you need to segregate the sheep herds. Then you need to, uh, at the time of shearing, you need to uh, you know, put a specific kind of wool in terms of color or microns, mm. length, and what are the parameters used into separate bags and you need to label them. Okay. And we developed this methodology of labeling and managing at remote locations by using technology. Wow. Okay. Okay. So that was a start. Then we developed our own processing technology. The, proce the washing of wool is called scouring. That's the word used for washing of wool. Mm -hmm. So normally scouring is done using chemicals. Mm. Chemical like soap. Soap is a chemical. Yeah. So if you use that, then you're not got compliant. No. So you need to develop technologies for scouring, which are got compliant, which are natural, which mm. are organic. Mm. So that was our input. So the entire, for, if you are looking at the European market, 
And the entire chain, right from the source, the grass the sheep uh, grazes on, mm. to a uh, scouring, to uh, conversion into products, mm. the entire chain, the value chain has to be certified organic. So every process step. Yes, every process step. step has to. You need to look into each of these process steps, mm. and you need to work with the processors and train them, mm -hmm. bring them the technologies, give them the, build them as a part of a network, and so that they are compliant. And you have mm. to give them enough business at a premium so that they stick to you and not yeah. abandon you. Because mm -hmm. our policy is at this age, we don't want to invest heavily into manufacturing systems or, uh, mm -hmm. you know. So we don't own any manu uh, manufacturing. Uh, uh, we don't own the factories or the sheds. Or mm -hmm. we, uh, we work with partners. We train them. Mm -hmm. we, and help them, give them a vision and lead them on to that vision. Okay. And give them a better value proposition. Amazing. So that's how we work with them. To me, it sounds also cost heavy. It is cost heavy. Uh, and that is why we need to look at markets which can afford to pay that premium. Okay. Okay. If the market cannot pay the premium, I'm not going to lower my uh, quality and no. the systems and methods to meet to the market. I will go to a market which will pay the premium. So you were from the start very clear on not bulging to the the cost, you know, reduction methodologies or something to to no. enter a market where you can easily sell. I wouldn't say easily sell. Mm. but who understand the value proposition. Mm. Okay. So that was the key, yeah. yeah. In fact, we have a buyer for mm. the cardigan from Denmark. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she's very happy with us. Okay. And she buys uh, women wear, cardigans, pullovers for women and children. Uh, this is what I learned when I was dealing with technology in NRDC, mm -hmm. we never disclose what technology a company is licensing from us mm -hmm. because the entire uh, value chain to develop that and convert it into a product, it's a very long process. It is, it is. So you need to, you need to maintain the uh, secrecy, the trade secret on behalf of your client. Mm, agreed. If you do, if you start you know, disclosing, then uh, it's not fair. No. On an average, you know, um, how much time does the end-to-end -end process take as compared to any, any other product that could be available in the market? Well, let's look at the wool. Mm. Uh, wool is shared twice a year. Autumn and spring. Yeah. From the sheep. Yes. Summertime, the sheep grows, go up to the upper regions of the Himalayas, very close to the Tibetan border. Yeah. It's verdant green grassland. They graze on. And before they come down, by autumn, by August, the shearing season starts. Mm. And once a sheep is sheared of the wool, they don't have the cover to keep them from uh, the cold so they have to come down to the lower regions okay so graze at lower uh, regions in the winter mm. and again uh, through the winters again their uh, sheep will grow on their body and by springtime say by march or april latest the next round of shearing takes place mm. and then they go the herdsmen take the uh, flock of sheep up to the hills, up to the mountains. Mm. So we need to uh, get the wool at these two points and estimate what is the kind of market we think we should be able to sell. 
And <laughs> we, when we cut this, we segregate this, we classify it, and we put them in godowns. Mm. Okay. From there, we release based on what is the needs of that bull yes. and based on the quality of bull. So then it gets bifurcated into different processing channels and a conversion into whatever product that needs to be done. Whether it's a fine garment pullover, it requires finer wool. If it's carpet, it could be coarser wool. Yeah. How long did it take for you to set up this whole, you know, streamlined process? Well, uh, challenges. Actually, actually, the setting up the processes it's uh, it's more of man management. Mm. That's not too much of a challenge. The okay. challenge is to get the organic certification. Mm. Yeah. The certification process is tougher, especially when you're doing it for the first time. Mm. So the first round of certification we got almost after three years of our starting the process. Okay. And however the process... Wow. Yeah. Mm. So that takes time. That takes time. Any other challenges in this industry that yeah, you want uh, to on? Uh, then the, the biggest challenge is market, getting markets. Mm. We did visit some trade shows in Europe in the early years. Mm -hmm. Uh, 2015, we started this work. 2016, we visited trade shows, 2016 and 17. Mm -hmm. And we built some contacts, some connects, and uh, we worked on those. And uh, then we reached a fairly stable point. Then COVID happened. Yeah. In fact, the process of slowing down has started before COVID, the year before COVID, I would say. Mm -hmm. The European market uh, was affected yeah. the year before COVID. That's 2019. Mm -hmm. It was. It had started from 2018. So by the time we established, the market was the market that we are addressing mm -hmm. was going to a shake. So some yeah. of the clients, some of our buyers uh, were in uh, were in. Uh, they were having trouble. Yeah. And I think. Uh, even the European market was changing. So we got the early signals and we had started uh, slowing down. Also, okay. Yeah, before COVID struck us. Hmm. So by the time COVID struck, we had already uh, exited from some pockets which was very good. Mm. Otherwise, our losses would have been far more. Mm. So markets is the biggest challenge, technically, managing the value chain. And we work very closely with the research institutions in India. Yeah, okay. okay. Getting the research network motivated to mm. work in this field yeah. The next challenge. Okay, there are some people who are good, mm. but there are many more who may not like to believe what we are doing. Agree. Okay, so there is an element of naysayers, which is uh, which you need to manage. I suppose that is there any business. It is. Uh, Till now, by and large, we have been doing things on our own. Mm -hmm. We have not been going and seeking support from the government mm -hmm. uh, in terms of funding or in terms of uh, technology because we want to drive this the way we want. Mm -hmm. Typically, what happens when you are dealing with government, there are people in their best interest mm -hmm. are not knowing the market and not mm -hmm. sharing a vision. They direct you in a diff force you to go in a different direction. Direction. Mm. Yeah. Having worked in the government, uh, government organizations, 
Yeah. Because I came to head a government organization from the private sector. Yes. Okay. So I had to face a lot of challenges mm. when I was working here. Okay. So uh, the kind of success stories that I developed, people did not understand the early stages. You need to support organizations at the early stages. You need to mm. understand the early signals. Mm. Okay, if you don't do that, you kill them, kill the organization. Mm. Like, many a flower is born to bloom and seem, you know, you have placed there like that. So you just kill very early starters sometimes. Mm. In fact, there was one company I had fought to the name to support. Mm. The company's name is Unifor. Mm-hmm. We put in uh, some investment. The company we uh, invested early stage investment in the company. Okay. And we got a returns of about fifteen times in seven years. The company got returns from the equity that was invested. Okay. And today, that company is being selected by a World Economic Forum as one of the most amongst the promising startups. New technology-based startups globally, mm. and these are based on invitation. These don't happen across the board. No. So this is the kind of quality you need to build in the people. So you need to identify the people, support them, mm. support, and uh, you know, once you select them, you partner them, you need to support them, and mm. need to. Uh, basically, if they're being, uh, if they're having problems from the system, mm-hmm. you think like you need to shield them from the system at the early stages. Yeah. If you want to build winners, you need to do that. That is a lot. So there are a lot of such companies. There's another company I mentored after my retirement. Uh, this is a company called Team Indus. Okay. They are participating in a in a competition by Google called Google Lunar X Prize. Mm-hmm. To develop a robotic craft to land on the moon. Okay. To move at least 500 meters and send images back to Earth. Okay. And all of this, based on open source, it's a small team of youngsters who are working here. So the technology is all open source. Mm-hmm. So this is the power of what you can do if you believe in work in that. Mm-hmm. And they were rated uh, uh, among they were among the top three competitors in this Google X Prize uh, Lunar X Prize competition. Uh, they built the uh, lunar rovers and all that. However, they could not get the money mm. to uh, uh, to to launch them, the craft, to reach the outer orbit of the moon. They could not raise enough funds. No. They were going via ISRO. Of course, uh, they uh, 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 they had to use ISRO. ISRO, basically, the cost of uh, uh, the launching is a lot less compared to some of the other opportunities, but they couldn't raise what was required by ISRO to launch it. And therefore, they, the, the deadlines, the launch deadlines kept getting delayed. Till, uh, and incidentally, none of the companies that were participating in the competition could get their funding together to do that. And therefore, Google called out the competition. Okay. That's so because, sad. Uh, yeah. That is so sad. That is sad, but this is what happened. That's what. So what we advise them at that time is okay. There's a competition, fine, mm. but you need to brand yourself as an aerospace startup. Mm. So you have a for-profit company and a not-for-profit company. Mm. Not-for-profit entity could be the face that interacts with the government, mm-hmm. and the for-profit entity should be. What is you should be the technologies that you're absorbing, you mm. should be able to convert that and build new uh, solutions mm. based on market needs. Yeah, 
And that you can't change at the end. You need to plan that right at the beginning when you're starting yes. on your journey. To have a split on yes. this. Yes. So that was what we advised. And that's how we held into structure. Our advice is uh, we won't get into the integrity of that technology being used. Mm. They have their own team working on that. But we look at the bigger picture and we help them to connect with partners mm. or with the government. Sir, what is your advice to such you know, intelligent brains across the globe that have amazing ideas to work with and, and maybe have already started a startup or in the progress, but then struggling for funding, you know? Fund, funding is the biggest challenge. Yeah. It is. And, and uh, a lot of it is sometimes just luck. Because yeah. you, you need to make your pitch. Uh, and it may click, it may not click. Yeah. Fortunately, today, things are getting streamlined. Mm -hmm. This is being understood a lot better today. And they you have networks in place that are available to help you. Uh, informal networks, formal networks. So you need to touch as many bases as you can, right from friends and family to government to, uh, you know, startup funds uh, to whatever you have to touch as many bases. That's mm. a full-time job. And one person in your company has to just do that. Look for funds. Mm. It's a full-time job. And we, you need to basically... You have to be a very good communicator. You need to tell your story in mm. few simple words. And you need to have a connect. Yeah. Not just a technology connect, but also an emotional connect. If you can build an emotional connect, it helps. People want to do good. I, I guess this will be a very useful tip for people who are having such ideas and wondering where to go, what to do with the funding. Yeah, that is true. Of course, in India, these things were uh, unknown, say, even, say, 10 years back. Mm. Most of these connects of funding have emerged in the last five years, I would say. Mm. Today, it's fairly well organized. Fairly well organized. Even government has got very good schemes mm. to support startups, to encourage startups. Yes. We should start there earlier. Yeah, I know. You know. So uh, it's a good time to be young and dream big. And if you have a story, if yeah. you have a, uh, you need to look at a product, a global product. Don't look at just a country specific product. Mm -hmm. Because you don't know what is the solution that you build, where is going to be accepted first. Mm -hmm. Quite often we find is, solutions that we build here in India get accepted outside the country first. Mm. So you do your test, a development and acceptance outside, and then you bring it in. I worked and traveled extensively in Africa. Mm. Youngsters in Africa, in countries in Africa, today look towards India or to technology hubs like Bangalore or Hyderabad the way our generation of youngsters 30, 40 years back looked at the US or the Silicon Valley. Mm. Today, they all want to come to India from countries in Africa. Uh, you know, for instance, I was, uh, I used to go, we had a, a very interesting project in Kodiva, that's Ivory Coast. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used to go there very often. So on my way back uh, at the airport, I was changing the local currency, that CEFA, back to U.S. dollars. Mm -hmm. There was a guy across the counter who was doing the change. When he got to know that uh, I'm from India, mm -hmm. he just walked over and said, hey, I want to meet you. I want to go to India. I want to go to Bangalore. <laughs> you know, so they all aspire. I have mm -hmm. lots of instances the youngsters, young people, they really aspire mm. to ex share the experience of the learning mm. here in India. The reason being, it's a very non-structured society. Mm. Unlike the West, West is very structured. You put into a, 
you know, uh, into a straight jacket, and you're not supposed to do uh, take too much of freedom. You're supposed to follow the rules. Whereas we believe in breaking the rules. Yeah. In the process, you learn. The system allows you to do that, so you learn. And today, when changes are taking place so rapidly. Mm. You need to break the rules to learn the new rules. Yeah. The old rules don't apply anymore. No. For instance, the post-COVID world is going to be very different from the pre-COVID world. I'm just taking a small example. Mm-hmm. Whole concept of work from home. Yeah. Is going to stay on even after the lockdowns open up. So you need to have the freedom to explore. uh these new opportunities that are coming mm. and with internet information is available on tap yes you don't have to be in the west to tap mm. the information you can get it source it anywhere from any home from wherever mm. yeah. and plus what you need is a good network mm you need a supportive network to take you along mm. to mentor and that network is also falling in place mm. especially the iit alumni network in for uh, youngsters in india mm. that's a very supportive network that they can tap in i'm just I... giving one example like this there are a lot of other examples mm. totally agree now for some questions that are generic for the younger generation to learn from you okay <laughs> how does one go about identifying his or her own career path or life goal you need to follow your passion hmm today today the jobs of the future are not going to be 9 to 5 no is going to be 24 by 7 they are yeah so unless you like what you do uh. you cannot remain a pen pusher sitting at a table you know coming in the no. morning and walking out in the evening you can't that no. era is over that is done with okay that's history that's history so you need to really like what you do mm So I would like to turn the question other way around. What is it you like? Start from there. Mm-hmm. Start from there. What you like? Yeah. Um. Start with what you're passionate about. Hmm. Okay. So that anything that you do, any business that you do, they nine. Uh, you know, ninety percent of the work is very mundane and very routine. Only ten percent or less is going to be exciting. Yeah. So that mundane routine, ninety percent. should not put you off you still need to pursue that to make it a success i agree so passion is important and it reminds me what you when you ask me the question reminds me when i was getting out of school graduate school mm. my uncle who lives in canada sent me a card if you it was written there mm-hmm. as he walked along the path of life mm look out for opportunities and grab them mm. otherwise you'll miss them totally correct so once you define what you want to do what you what's your passion what you like to do yeah. look out for opportunities in that direction with that mindset mm. and whatever comes your way grab it don't be too selective yeah don't bother too much about earnings and how much you going to make money and all that comes later you just like it mm. and grab the opportunities as they coming your way and then work on it mm. to make a success right you already answered the question i had <laughs> what to do after <laughs> okay you got it right so Uh, yeah that was good but along the way you know of course there are opportunities coming up and we should be smart enough to pick it up take the right one up there are also challenges that would oh, come yes. yes 
what is your take on that well uh, if you want to do something mm. uh, there are risks and opportunities they go together definitely if you don't take the risks you won't be able to capitalize on the opportunities so you need to balance the risks versus the opportunities mm. so uh, well i am not a management graduate but in your management school you are taught to do risk cost benefit analysis or yes. risk opportunity analysis and you know you are allowed you required to do all that yeah and uh, basically you need to once you decide what you wish to do mm. then you need to have a structured way of approaching the problem mm-hmm. then don't go helter skelter at random then apply your mind in a yeah. structured process bring your learning to the table okay i come from engineering background so we do a lot of analytical analytical uh, analysis and processing mm-hmm. you know using mathematical tools mm-hmm. so uh, we are familiar with that kind of analysis which and today you can do very well with using spreadsheets or some statistical tools and you know, a lot of tools available in the market so and so this is part of the training mm. uh, uh, when we mentor youngsters uh, doing startups we basically go through a process where we do a lot of brainstorming mm. and help them uh, uh, you know uh, navigate through and build a business strategy mm. for the long term yeah like what i mentioned a little while earlier for team indus we said have a for profit and a not for profit mm because if it's a competition competition elite should be through a, a not for profit mm. but the business what you learn you bring it to your business entity which is for profit mm so that's a strategic decision that's a very interesting take and i'm just thinking why haven't i thought of it <laughs> because yeah the, no, you, haven't, you haven't consulted me that's why <laughs> <laughs> okay this is very helpful personally for my business <laughs> all right um is there anything else that you would like to share with the audience yeah i would like to share a small story an actual uh, practice that we did uh, when yeah. we worked in uh, mizoram for your viewers mizoram is one of the small remote states in india in the far east uh, neighboring myanmar which is earlier called uh, uh, burma burma it was it's a really remote place and uh, they had uh, they had some problems uh, with their uh, 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 with their bamboo cultivation Mm-hmm. and in fact what happened was uh, uh, bamboo grows wild out there mm-hmm. okay and every 50 years or so they say bamboo flowering takes place okay when bamboo flowering takes place there's a lot of food available uh, on the ground okay so rats rats multiply they rats eat and they multiply okay and once the rats multiply they start eating the other food products and grains oh and there is a famine food shortage that oh. happened 50 years back okay so this is and i'm talking about years. i'm talking about the period about 2008 9 10 period when we were working on the project to 2008 7 8 9 this period and this 50 year was approaching and they wanted to cut the bamboo before the flowering took place in mm-hmm. their wisdom they, they cut the bamboo all together okay mm-hmm. after they cut the bamboo what do you do so we said well see what grows well out there mm-hmm. and what we found was turmeric grows very well out there turmeric turmeric okay so we trained 
we train the local farmers, local, the tribes, there's a tribes, tribal people to grow turmeric there. Okay. And we set up the turmeric processing facility out there. Uh, we we basically form producer companies with these tribals. Mm. Uh, there are five thousand of them, mm. and we uh, we uh, had decentralized uh, drying take place of the turmeric. Mm -hmm. uh, Use setting up dehumidifiers. Solar we basically by solar drying mm -hmm. we dry at the the, uh, the the hot air generated through solar air dryers. Mm -hmm. We Right, the turmeric at the field level because uh, uh, this thing is very remote. Mm. Mm. Now, the markets are in uh, Calcutta, which is Kolkata mm. now. Mm. Okay, that's about almost a few hundred uh, kilometers away, maybe a thousand kilometers away. Mm. Okay, it's a long journey. And yeah. if you have to carry uh, uh, moisture, then you're just carrying, there's no value for that, and you're paying no. for it. It's so heavy. Do as much, and it's heavy, exactly. So as much processing there. Yeah. So we have a decentralized processing as a farmhead, which is yeah. using solar drives. And then at district level, we had put humid dehumid fires. Uh -huh. uh, and where we dried it further. Okay. And then we got a hold of some exterminic exporters. And plus, before that, we got this whole area certified organic. Mm. That was the experience of certifying organic. Okay. We got the whole area certified organic. <laughs> so, we had organic, turmeric available, and we got some exporters from Calcutta to pick up this produce mm. and export it out of the country. Okay. Okay. And the thing was so successful uh, earlier, the turmeric was grown in the south in Kerala. Mm. And mm -hmm. turmeric export hub, auction hub, mm -hmm. was in a road in Kerala. Mm. Okay. Now, this project became so successful that auction hub shifted to Guwahati, to northeast. <laughs> so, we have... So... We changed the entire lifestyle of people, local rivals, poor people. Mm. And you have organic, certified organic turmeric, better than what you get in Kerala, but that was not certified organic. Uh -huh. Amazing. This is change management in practice. This is change management. So you need to think out of the box. Yeah. So today, you need to think out of the box. You need to see how to benefit the local community. Mm. Totally agree. How to benefit the local people. Mm. If they benefit, they will support you. If they support you, you are in business. Because people will seek your advice yeah. and seek your services. Yes. This is... Amazing. This is amazing. Uh, sir, I hear from the discussions that we've been having that you have been mentoring businesses as a part of what you've been doing. So um, is there any way that people could approach you for business mentoring uh, or so? Or are you yes, willing to support? I am I am available. I'm available to have a dialogue as long as we can have it remotely. Awesome. And I don't see a problem. I don't see a problem in that today. Awesome. How does one reach out to you? You can reach me through my mobile or uh, through my email ID. Yeah. Okay. Superb. This is fantastic, sir. I feel like I've been through a very, you know, interesting, you know, way to change management and practice session today. Any other stories that you want to share with us? Oh, there are plenty of stories. <laughs> there are lots of stories. <laughs> Shall I share one more? Definitely, sir. Please. Okay. 
this company I talked about, which has been uh, which is being uh, uh, now been uh, supported by the World Economic Forum. Yeah. Unifor. Yeah. Yeah. They started the journey in 2008. Okay. They were uh, developing uh, solutions based on voice biometrics. Okay. Okay. What that means is you pick up an uh, ordinary, simple feature phone mm -hmm. and speak in any language mm -hmm. and use that to populate a database. Okay. So in India, they, the first version I'm talking about in 2008-9 period, we, um, the first version they have, they were supporting 14 Indian languages. Mm -hmm. plus, plus English. Okay. And we did a pilot. We invested in the company. Mm. So we had to support them. Mm. We had to give them some business. Yes. <laughs> okay. They didn't have any clients. <laughs> <laughs> so we were working in a project in Madhya Pradesh. Okay. This was a project. We were working in remote parts of Madhya Pradesh. Mm -hmm. In the district of Madhya Pradesh, mm -hmm. where we are working with the Anganwadis. Anganwadis are the uh, support mechanism uh, uh, run by the Ministry of Women and Child Development yeah. to support pregnant women and newborn infants and small children mm -hmm. in the early years. Yes. Okay. And this is part of a scheme to cut down the infant mortality and the maternal mortality rates. Yeah. Infant mortality rates in India, in those parts of the country, were very high. Mm. Higher than sub-Saharan Africa. Mm. What our analysis found was, it's not that we didn't have good mechanism, we support mechanism in place. The government had built these systems in place uh, for since the 70s, uh, mm -hmm. 1970s, been running for almost 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. However, data being collected was on paper. Mm -hmm. And by the time that gets transcribed and action, action uh, made actionable, mm -hmm. the infant who has low uh, weight mm -hmm. passes away, unfortunately. So we need to have a mechanism where information can be passed rapidly. So we created, uh, 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 using this <clears throat> ordinary mobile phones, mm -hmm. where uh, Anginwadi workers, we were called ASHA workers, mm -hmm. they would, uh, first of all, they have to register each case by uh, speaking the name of the person. You okay. need to authenticate the person, <clears throat> mm -hmm. okay, by speaking into the phone. So mm -hmm. there's an authentication process. Yeah. And then take the weight measurements of the uh, newborn child yeah. and report it on a, on a periodic basis. And if it is found below mm. uh, the norm, there's a, a standard uh, made by um, available. It's a World Health Standard. Mm -hmm. Below that, mm. you need to have the food reached out in immediately. Okay. Okay. Food passes already there kept at the Anganwadi centers, but they had to reach out to this remote lady, the mother, uh. feeding the infant immediately. Uh, and uh, so we created this uh, uh, biometric-based systems which fed the data automatically onto a scoreboard, and the, the dashboard would see what the uh, data is on a daily basis, would analyze that, yeah. you find the, uh, the critical areas, you drill down, and see that next day, food reaches there. So mm. cut down infant mortality to zero. Wow. Okay. That was a thing. And, uh, uh, and the Anganwadi also, we wanted to transform. We transformed the Angan, the Anganwadis were built in very shabby rooms. We were transformed them on the concept of Bala, building as a learning tool. Okay. So on the, uh, the, on the building itself, there would be, uh, uh, you know, uh, puzzles on the floor where kids would come and play with. And you have to 
make it interesting. Okay. Plus, on the ground outside, we would grow uh, basic vegetables and fruits, which would be fed to these uh, infants and mothers. Mm -hmm. And more important is, the government was giving a lot of money to buy toys for the children. Mm. We were training these ladies at the Anganwadi centers to make their own wooden toys ah. using non-toxic colors, which would be used there locally rather than importing from China. Mm. This is a self-contained model. Contown infant mortality, create interest so that they all come to the center. Yeah. And create economic activity for making these toys, use them there, and sell it in other Anganwadis. I'll share those photographs. Please do. And, and attendance was taken, daily attendance was taken yeah. by speaking into the phone, based on which women who were working there were paid their wages directly into their bank accounts. That was before Aadhaar was introduced in the country. Oh my God. That is amazing. So there are amazing stories like this. Yeah. A lot of things can be done. It has to be done differently. We have many such stories, not just one or two, there are many such stories. Yeah. This is unique, really. Uh, Sir, this has been a pleasure for me, a huge learning experience for me to, to having interviewed you. Um, thank you very much. I enjoyed it too. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you very much again. And, and I wish you um, good health and happiness uh, also thank to you. your family. Yes, thank, thank, you. thank you very much, thank sir. You. Have a nice weekend. Okay. Thank you. You too. Take care. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Yeah. Wow, what an episode. I truly enjoyed every bit of this and I'm sure most of you have found this very useful and all the experiences that Somnath sir has shared with us would be an inspiration for us to take forward our career or business ideas further. Truly an innovation evangelist. And what a change management in practice and for the season one. If you are liking more of such episodes, please do remember to share your comments, like, share and subscribe. This is exactly how we are learning from each other and growing this community. I am working on the season two already. You can expect something to come up soon after the summer break. Until then, this is Komati Sankran signing off from the Clay Studio. Bye-bye.